Hi, I'm Peter, and this is Go Verbenown. Today we're talking to Greg and Mitchell from ASAP Science. Over the past couple years, Greg and Mitch have gotten over 3 million subscribers to their channel, ASAP Science. And it's no wonder, because they cover stuff that people care about, like, really care about. They answer questions like, why do we like the smell of our own farts? And should we be eating insects? And I don't know about you, but I've always wondered about all of these questions. And so they answer them. And that actually speaks to the larger thing that they do, which is they inspire interest in science in a way that makes it accessible to everybody who might not have otherwise thought science was cool or interesting. In this first part of the interview, we're going to be talking to them a little bit about just general stuff about their channel. You know the standard questions by now. And then in the second part, we're going to be doing things a little bit differently. And I'm not telling you what, because I want you to go check out the second part. So, all right, here's the first part. Let's, let's look. Shoop. Bah. So I'm Mitch and I'm Greg and we run a channel called ASAP Science in which we take the daily experiences in people's life and explain the science behind it to them. <laughs> Can you add to that? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so we make a weekly video, we put it on YouTube. Um, yeah, our sort of manifesto is we want to get as many people as possible interested in science. We try to relate to people's lives by taking experiences that they might have had and then explaining the science behind them in order to interest them in the science at large. Why did you guys decide to start ASAP Science? So, well, we both graduated from the University of Guelph. I was in teacher's college, and so I'd finished that. I'd, I'd spent a lot of time learning about um, sort of how education was changing, how students were very disengaged with the way that school worked. A lot of focus was on technology and, and trying to engage like a new generation of people. So that was sort of in the back of my mind, and then you could talk about your experience. Yeah, so I had a bit of experience in like as a hobby like film and just creating videos and had met some YouTubers while I was working like in the travel industry randomly um, and realized that they were creating content on the internet full time and I thought that was really fascinating and interesting and so um, kind of those combined things I started doing some work with them and then slowly we were like hey we can use this medium that actually reaches tons of people outside of yourself not necessarily you know the amount we're reaching now I never really imagined it would be like that but just the fact that you could reach people that were not in your own social circle was really cool so we sort of sat down and thought like what if we you know the way that we try and explain science to our friends who are not science inclined or not didn't do the same degree with us like what if we took those ideas and tried to put them online in a simple way where tons of people could understand it and like with Greg's experience with kids kind of like how interested they were in YouTube we kind of thought that was a really good space for the stuff that we want to do yeah and so we didn't we, we gave ourselves an important ultimatum, which was to try and do one video a week for a year and just see what happens. So that was really motivational in the beginning, and I think that was something that we look back on as so important mm -hmm. to taking us to where we are now because we were able to stay motivated to do it, and then it actually immediately made people make sense. They thought, okay, if we come back every week, we're going to get a new video, and that really helped it gain momentum, and now here we are, two years <laughs> later, and I'm like, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Two years in, what has surprised you about being on YouTube? I think the most surprising thing is just like the sheer momentum of like the internet and of like YouTube as one single video medium, obviously as like the largest video medium, medium on the internet. Um, I think like we obviously wanted to build a channel and gain a following. That was like part of like the objective when we first started because the whole point was like how do we reach people who don't like science? But understanding like how many times our videos and many other science videos have been watched um, leisurely like in kids spare times or you know a lot of teachers and professors will say they use our videos but I would say the vast majority of people are watching these videos as like a leisure activity I think that's the most shocking mm -hmm. part yeah like I think yeah for me it's one is that the popularity of education on YouTube is pretty fascinating I think it's almost like mainstream media just decided that people didn't want to learn and then just like made all their media go towards these sometimes very creative things but maybe not like sciencey things mm -hmm. So then it's just interesting that when people have the choice to watch what they wanted, so many people were choosing science or education, which is fascinating in a good way. And the second thing was I think what surprises me is just like the power of like how niche YouTube is and how everyone can find what they want to watch on YouTube. And as I've, we've both started to learn how to use YouTube more. Like we were talking about yesterday, like I only watch YouTube now. There was a time when I was sort of in between and sort of like every niche thing that I'm interested in, I can get like good content on YouTube. So I'm just surprised with how how large it's grown and then also how good the content is for these specific things that I'm interested in. So 
Yeah, I'd also say that, like the evolution over those two years of like how I don't want to say much better YouTube became, but like for our mm -hmm. own interests, like the things that are available now that weren't available two years ago, partially because there's just more people creating content, there's more money being put into content, so people can you know do really interesting shows that cover experiences that you know require a budget or require traveling or anything like that. Um, I think is like pretty amazing. I think maybe five years ago it was mostly just like home uploaded videos mm -hmm. and I think that's still like one of the most important feels is that it is authentic and it's not like big budget but now it is like our TV is also YouTube like our fun interactions and like we watch vlogs and we watch this that's on YouTube but now also like some of our news and like our big shows that we watch are literally just like cast on YouTube so that's in the two years that we've done this, it's I think changed. like completely changed. Yeah. Like something like Vice, for example, where we each have shows that we like really like on Vice. Um, I don't know if Vice was making very many videos two two and a half years ago. No, they I weren't. Well, yeah. They're not in the way they are now. Yeah, yeah, like now it's like that's something that's exploded. That's huge. All the late night shows now have like YouTube channels. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's definitely exploded in the past few years. And to think like like we sit down and eat dinner <laughs> and we're just put on YouTube. <laughs> It's just it's weird. Like yeah, we have a Chromecast, so we just like are watching YouTube during dinner. Every I never even it feels think like to TV because it's on a TV, but like yeah. it's not TV. Yeah, I guess like that evolution is like good. It's a double edged sword, right? Because mm -hmm. it like it requires that like the barrier to entry is higher now for like what YouTube was of like people just being able to put on their webcam or whatever is changing. Mm -hmm. Like you do yeah. need to have like some level of. Um, I don't want to say budget, but the way a film, like uh, the way your vlogs look or the way you're talking to the camera, like there is like a standard of quality now, yeah. which is cool in one sense, but like I wonder how it affects like the kind of authentic stuff that might have been put on two years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you walk me through the process of making a video from when you first have an idea to pressing publish on the video? So we're, okay, we're in the beginning stages of one for our new one. Mm -hmm. So it's like fresh and that. So we have a large bank of ideas thankfully from a lot of people who, either friends or family, who whenever we see them are like, oh, you should do a video about this. <laughs> or um, people who comment on Twitter and YouTube, and that's so helpful for us. So we sort of have a large bank of that. Plus we read a lot of like magazines like the New Yorker and um, Science and Scientific American that also help us sort of like stay up to date with what's new and what's relevant. And then we sort of think, okay, this is the idea. And then we start the research process, which is the process that we're in right now with two scripts, which is really tough. It's a mm -hmm. long, sort of tedious um, process of trying to figure out what information people want to hear. If it's really concise, or sorry, like very detailed science, how do we break it down? What do people actually need to know? How are we not going to lose people? It's a constant struggle, reading each other's scripts back and forth. And then from that point, we have the final script, and it's usually Mitch is the last person with think he has to say it. And then we split up, and we sort of storyboard out how we're going to draw the whole thing. And we come together and we talk it through with our two ideas, which is a really good idea, because mm -hmm. like, we kind of get two perspectives. And sometimes yeah. you're kind of like, oh, so I don't that really know super better. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and it's like really good. And that part is actually quite fun. And then I start drawing it, and then Mitch edits it. I record audio, speaking. put it together. Music already exists, and then and then we put it on. So. From that description, it's like the research is the hardest part. I yeah, would say. I think making it, finding the interesting angle is usually like the hardest part. Like, when we use this as in examples and talks and stuff, but like trying to find, like you can, we've done an episode like on vitamin D, but just calling it like the science of vitamin D, we knew wasn't necessarily like an interesting way to appeal to people. And so, even literally just like, what is the title of this video and how do we have that interesting angle where the content isn't going to change but like what's the angle and so that one became like yeah. what would happen if you stop going outside um, which is a much more interesting question to like many more people um, who don't really care about science but are interested in like that phenomenon like if I, I spend all my day inside like what's happening to me and when it clicks it clicks and it's so great <laughs> yeah and sometimes it doesn't sometimes we have this topic and we're like we really want to do something on this but we just can't find a way like our mission really is like how do we make science accessible to a lot of people? Um, we're obviously not diving into like really deep science because we want to be you know accessible by people of all ages and of all levels of science and there are some amazing channels on YouTube that really do dive into like deep physics or whatever and, and they're there for that reason I think for even more people who are like super into um, science already um, and so for us it's like how do we make this question I, like how do we reach into people's lives and they can say like I've experienced that um, and now I need to know the answer because you mentioned that experience I had 
But yeah, afterwards, then what do we do? Afterwards, then we just upload. Yeah, then we just push <laughs> upload and, you know, you think of clever ways to, like, tweet it or promote it or whatever. And that's basically the end of it. We, like, look at it for a day or two and then we're like, okay, it's time to do the next one. <laughs> you get obsessed. You're like, oh my gosh, like, what is happening with this video? And then you kind of forget, like, after two days, you yeah. never look at it again. And all the information is <laughs> yeah. gone. And then you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so why is ASAP Science drawn? In the beginning, I mean, it wasn't... We sort of reflected on that a lot more to figure out why we did that. Like, it was a conscious decision, but I think we realize now how valuable it was a lot more. We saw, we were obviously inspired by other channels that we saw that were successful, but also we wanted people to not be intimidated by the science. So it's kind of a very, um, it's not, like, I guess childish is one way of describing it, but it's a non-intimidating like um, medium. So people aren't intimidated by it. They, like, it's, it can be funny, it can be like, sarcastic it also can be a way of showing like a mouse being injected by something like we would have right. to go get a mouse and like i don't know so it was a way of like visually depicting things we never could have in another situation mm -hmm. but i think what we realize now is so valuable is that they come across as these like concise sort of like non-intimidating fresh fun things which helps people to really enjoy them and be able to think like to absorb the science. So they're not focusing on our personalities. Yeah. They're not focusing on the objects or the explosions or whatever that is that a lot of other science in the past has been marketed as. They're focusing on these like concise visual things which helps them learn. Yeah, I yeah. think like part of it is sort of stripping the personality out of it, which is such an advantage in some channels and could be to ours as well, but also the advantage of not having a personality in the videos is that it really just is about the topic. You know, like, it's, it's not about us becoming famous. Like, our hands are not gonna become famous from just being on the video. So really, what, when people see the video, I think they know there's no ulterior motive to it. Yeah. Um, they don't have to, apart from, like, my voice or whatever, there's no real way for them to be like, oh, I just don't like that person as much as this person when I'm learning. Like, it's really just, here's the topic, they don't have to think about people, and it's just like, cool, I'm just learning about the science of love or why the brain does this, and it's, it's simplified in that way, I think. Totally, yeah. But in that same regard, like, not having a person in it is, like, it's also a double-edged sword, which is why we started ASAP Thought, because some people, some people learn in that way. They want the personal connection. They want that sort of somebody they can relate to. Um, and so I think hopefully now ASAP Thought sort of facilitates what ASAP Science couldn't do. Um, ASAP Science, like, allows, like, this broad reach, I think, to people in all different things. But ASAP Thought kind of yeah. is our personality for people who might learn better that way. Yeah, totally. And it was just funny because it was like a decision that was made that we realized was a good decision, but at the time it was yeah. like, oh, I was drawn away more. Yeah, there's it definitely lots of things, like even like our logo. <laughs> we always laugh about how we did not intentionally make it, like the logo. We were going to change the logo every single time we were doing an episode. It was going to be like ASAP Science, but one time it was drawn, and then that time it was like the second time it was like little paper figures, and then we got lazy, and we just like used the paper figures again, and then we got lazy again, and just used the paper figures, so now like that just that became stuck. like the intro and the logo, and now that is what it is. I don't even know what those paper are. Yeah, there's <laughs> somewhere around here. We got lucky. Yeah, like lots, <laughs> lots of things are lucky, and in this medium it is just like so many. I don't know that there can be that many intentional things. Otherwise it does seem inauthentic, I think. Yeah, totally. Inauthentic or mm -hmm. unauthentic? <laughs> what are your thoughts about the idea of community as it applies to YouTube? Yeah, I see that as a weird, that's a weird word for me too. Like, it's almost like fake sometimes when mm -hmm. people say that we're community. Like, yeah. I think maybe like it was that way when YouTube first started and I think like we know a couple of YouTubers who started like six years ago and I think there was like a real community then because you would, they were just like people who weren't getting paid, they were just making videos for fun. Um, kind of like, you know, you'd find a forum online like seven years ago and you could just have this community and chat with people and that was like a real community, but I feel like the words sometimes used superficially now, like for us, like, well, ASAP Science is hard to build a community because it's not a personality in the first place, but with that many people, it's also just like impossible to build like a real genuine community, but like that buzzword is used by everyone who's like, oh, I love the community or like, I love my followers and you know what I mean? And I guess that's used by like celebrities and everyone alike to like make their audience feel important. And I want our audience to feel important, but like it, it does seem like a buzzword for sure, community. I'm not really sure what it means for us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, like and subscribe and comment on these videos and like, let us know. And, and the, we do that stuff too. It's like part of the best practices to make sure people are engaging. But like even in this engagement, it's like, I think it's genuine in some degrees, but then in others, it's maybe not. But I think YouTube holds so strongly to that word because of where it came from. And because like they are built on that community. Like that's what made YouTube last, I think. Yeah. 
at, over any other video platform. Totally. Yeah. And then I guess one of the final thing is a lot of the interactions that happen, like, cause there are lots of interactions that happen between creators and watchers, uh, is that a lot of the interactions don't happen on YouTube and everybody's okay with that, except maybe YouTube. Um, again, self-plugging, check out Emily's video. Cause she talks about how Emily, I thirst, mm. uh, cause she talks about how like YouTube comment system from her point of view, isn't to drive interaction. Right. It's to drive people to the website. Right. And if people get on the website, then YouTube has control of what they're doing. Right. Like, yeah, there's that element of, like, you get to put your say in, but then CGP Grey yeah, is, like, like, you know... It's like a Reddit for him. Yeah, you just open a door, yell in your opinion, and close the door. Right. Um, but then seeing how people drift to, like, Tumblr or Twitter, mm. that's where it seems to me like all the actual social... Like real conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I think so, too. Like, I, I feel like I have more, because you can't really respond to individuals on YouTube in, in a real way. Like, Twitter facilitates that better if you want to yeah, do Yeah, it's, it's not designed properly. Yeah, like, it for sure. The comment section on YouTube is, like, the weakest of all, I think. But, yeah. But it, in, like, the big bubbles of communities, like, the science community, like, there's definitely, like, the science YouTubers, and then there's science audience, and, you know, like, that's a community, I guess. But Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, definitely, like, that comment system. That's so true. And we're back. Except we're in a different place. I don't understand. I guess this is what happens when you realize you need to redo something and it's dark outside. Eh. You may remember just a few months ago that we talked to Hank Green, and when we did that, he told us about the importance that curiosity plays in the learning process. And I think that what Greg and Mitchell do when they talk about, you know, the mundane things, the science of mundane things, the science of everyday occurrences, I think they do a really good job of inspiring that curiosity. And I think that's hugely important. So kudos to them. Now, in the second part of this interview, here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna ask them one more question from my pool, and then I'm going to give them a question that I got from Nick when I asked Nick, that is to say Nick Jenkins, what he would ask other YouTubers if he were in my position. And he had an awesome question. And Greg and Mitch have an awesome answer for you to hear. So, if you're ready for that, just go ahead, editing screen, click it, Click down below where it says next, uh, and let's get the show on the road, all right? All right, I'll see you in a bit. 